Hello and welcome to Unleashed, the show that explores how to thrive as an independent professional. Unleashed is produced by Umbrex, which connects you with the world's top independent management consultants. I'm your host, Will Bachman, and I'm excited to be here today with Lemon Williams, who is a cybersecurity expert who focuses on serving utilities. He runs the firm Ionato Group, and he is the author of a new book, how to write quality compliance documentation. Lemon, welcome to the show. Thank you, Will. Thank you. Happy to be here. All right. So, might not be kind of bestseller material title, but this is the kind of book that I love to nerd out on. Tell me a little bit about uh, kind of the audience and kind of some of the key messages of your new book, How to Write Quality Compliance Documentation. All right. I'll be happy to. Um, the audience for the book are is anyone who's had to um, organize a process before that's not uh, fully been documented and organized. Uh, anytime anyone's talking about, we need to write a policy for this or we need to have better procedures. Um, so my experience as a consultant, uh, this is one of the biggest pain points that I saw is people not really being able to know where to get started or how to jumpstart exactly what components need to be in that high level documentation to sort of encase the process or that you're trying to control and um really you know what the what the intent and what the uh, objectives were of it yeah so there's a, i mean a couple ends of the spectrum of that and kind of at one end of the spectrum is an internal document that you're going to use just for your team where you want to document here's how we send an invoice out or something just to make sure everybody knows how to do it maybe it's just a quick loom video or something like that at the other end of the spectrum would be where you're really focused about making sure you're complying with some kind of regulatory mandatory stuff for the FDA or whatever are is your book which of the end of the spectrum is your book more geared towards it's definitely going to be geared towards the latter this is a, a way to figure out how to write your top level uh, documentation so that it can substantiate that you, that you have compliance and control over a process because that's really what we're looking at when we're looking at complying with uh, you know federal uh, and state entities is what they want to make sure that you have is that you have a person assigned to everything you have it you have clearly outlined what your commitment to this process is so first help me understand the problem statement so what in term and what drove you to write this so i am like give us some examples of where you've seen poorly written compliance documentation and the type of uh poor outcomes that that leads to so why should someone care about this so that's exactly why i i wrote this i brought it from my, a lot of my client experience consulting where a lot of the policy documentation that was required was just very, very poorly put together. Uh, usually what people start with is they start with a situation where they have internal knowledge of how to do something. They will kind of formalize that into something more like a checklist or sort of a cheat sheet for how things are done. And it's very loosely assembled um, and it's it doesn't really have the sort of flow of flow that it needs to actually control something. So we have we have these kind of poorly written sort of cobbled together from sticky notes and paste it down um, knowledge and, and tables and notes written there. What it actually leads to is poor transfer of knowledge. So two things you can't do at, at both ends. The first thing you can't do is that it's very difficult without a lot of training and OJT for someone new to come in and really understand actually what their job is and really even know the boundaries of what they're responsible for and what they're not. It's also in a situation where either you have a regulator that is going to want to review your processes or there is an incident and you have to substantiate that you had enough control over your processes that you were not negligent, then this that's also gonna be not sufficient to do that. So one of the things that I was doing over and over again was to kind of come out and outline exactly what these were, exactly how to state objectives and how to state your intent, how to formulate a policy that was going to allow you to continuously 
augment that with uh, sub documents like procedures in a very consistent way that keeps all that information neat and together more of a library and more and tells a better story mm -hmm. okay cool so walk us through some of the the key principles in the book on you know how to make good compliance documentation all right sure um first off we kind of look at the why of it and that's our objective and intent and we want to make sure that the the pros of it the actual wording of it you know provides some awareness kind of strengthens and bolsters the program really defines what it is that we're trying to do or control and why we're trying to do it and then another part of the book goes into our general writing styles of it um that's an, another thing that was happening is because you know, this is not formal documentation in the sense that it, it's not written in a hugely formal way, but it does have some some general guides to it in terms of one that needs to speak to exactly how the, that particular company or industry um, refers to things. You have to basically have a kind of a predetermined sort of catalog and titling and naming convention and system for it. You want to make sure that you have your proper version control and, and a very centralized template and you have approvals in place. You want to make sure that you actually have people um, listed by titles and roles and responsibilities for what they, what they do. And um, just make sure that you have this um, consistent look and feel throughout throughout it and that you have things numbered and sectioned. I know that sounds like some very, very basic things, but this really came from seeing this over and over again, how these documents weren't referenceable and it was hard for people to go on the same page. If you just typed everything in a straight piece of paper, Will, and you just had all this good information in there, but you didn't really have a section one, a section two, a section three, and you didn't really define what that pertained to, then it's hard for someone reading the same document or someone trying to follow you to know that they're on step five or that they're on section 12 or, or subsection 2A. Um, so making sure that we covered those sort of things in general writing styles was one thing that was important. And so in the book, I sort of put in a, a mock uh, policy here, and I have call outs that annotate where all those different places are, where we, we put in these sort of mechanical details mm -hmm. as to how, you know, when's the last time the document was revised, what's the uh, document's, you know, name, uh, you know, version number last review date and what the different sections of it need to be how the information needs to be broken up uh, in terms of the content that's a little bit of a different story I, I can get into that a little bit when you're in if you're interested yeah I, I am I mean it reminds me a bit of my Navy days in the submarine force uh, we'd have the reactor plant manual and you'd have for all the casualty procedures you'd have standardized sections they'd all be set up the same way so there'd be um, you know, there'd be like some caution. So the first section of it would be cautions, if there was any cautions about this procedure. Uh, then there would be initial conditions. So, and, and this would apply both to regular operating procedures as well, right? So before you enter this procedure, you have to have the following initial conditions. And then uh, if it was a casualty procedure, it might be, here's the immediate actions to take, and then there's the follow-up actions. Uh, and in the course of the follow-up actions, it would walk you through like, if this, then do that. If this, then that. You know, test this. If you get A, if you get B, true, false, do this, do that. So it kind of walk you through the sections. Um, and you know, to your point, it was all numbered um, and kind of you know, organized um, so that you could refer to like section one, part two, you know, chapter three, mm -hmm. step four, um, with version control. Uh, what are the sections that you recommend in a you know well done compliance document? Like, are, is there something parallel to what I described from the Navy days? It's it's very similar. It's, it's actually very similar. So our, the sections that we would have, you know, generally speaking, are we gonna we're gonna have a policy statement, and that's just your clear statement of what this is for. And there's also some some tips in here about you know language about using. Um, you know, shall and, and must and will versus using using should um, so that the language is a little bit stronger and strengthened and people understand that it's not optional. Um, we're going to have a purpose section and a scope section. And, you know, those things provide, you know, information on 
for who the audience that was written for and what it applies to. A lot of times you might have similar group subsections. So your scope area there can actually, you know, take you to those sections. It kind of works as a primer more the entire document actually sort of works as a primer because this is going to then maybe direct you to more detailed sub sub documentations uh, the big one of the biggest areas that you're going to have are your roles and responsibility area because that's where you really want people to understand for the function that they're serving what are the limits of responsibility for it and it's important to control that both at the low end and the high end. You want someone to know exactly what they need to do, but you also need to know what they what is what they need to not do and where where that responsibility begins and ends at. Um, so the other sections here that we have are we want to make sure that there's approvals here for um, who signed off on it. That's more of a record keeping thing for compliance, but it also sort of shows at what level the document is written in. And then you'll have, you know, organizational information. And a lot of it is also just audit information. The last time that it was updated and what was changed and updated on it. So if someone, you know, is familiar with the process, is familiar with the previous version of this document, they can easily sort of see where situations and conditions have changed that. So those are the, the general sections. And then we just talk about writing things clear, clearly and, and concisely quite a bit. And we talk about the level of maturity that you want to have for a process. So in the book, there's a table that talks about a process going all the way from rudimentary all the way up to a, to a leading process. And we talk about that, that process maturity. And the more detail you can put and you can and you can document it, the more concise you can make it by using the different sections and working the information that you need into a, a section where it makes sense that that's more mature your process is going to be. How what how do you recommend people do the version control? You know, if you if it's just one person, that's not so hard. But uh, when you're working across an organization, what tools have you seen? Is there a good software for that? Or how, how, what, what do you recommend around maintaining version control for some sort of compliance documents or, or any kind of documentation at a company? Well, one one thing that can be ubiquitous across all kinds of platforms, and we, and we've we've seen them, we've seen them all. There's electronic platforms. A lot of people use SharePoint or use different GRC systems to keep the documentation. But one main thing that works across all of those that is sort of agnostic technology is to have a standardized naming convention. Um, you're from the military, so you're used to to SOPs you know, and standard operating procedures and, and that sort of thing is have a naming convention that works in the section purpose applicability and even the version into the nomenclature of the document. That way, wherever that document goes, people understand what version they're on and what audience it's meant for. So if you had something that was for your operation support IT group, for your field offices in Philadelphia. It could be, you know, PHA, OT, IT, SOP, 526, you know, V002. And that way, since that version stays with it in the document, when, when, zero, when the new version comes in, 003 is there. And that keeps it nice, nice and neat, and people understand that they have that. That helps out a lot because we are using these over multiple platforms. Sometimes this is going to be even printed on paper. Sometimes it's going to be available through an internet. So what I what I found to do is that I want to make sure that we work, that we weave that into the document and make that part of the document lifecycle. Does that make sense, Will? It does. Um, so, but I guess I. I my, maybe let me ask, ask the question in a slightly different way. So let's say I'm at a company and you know, 50 or 100 people, right? And I want to, um, and I'm maybe a accounts uh, receivable clerk. So I am uh, trained up on how to send out invoices, but maybe we have um, procedures for each individual one of our big clients. They might have some particularities around what they need on their invoice. So I've been out for six months. I just came back from from, I don't know, let's say, uh, some leave, let's say. I came back to the company and 
I want to, and I'm sending an invoice to client X. So I want to go and I want to find, okay, what's the latest guidance for company X? I have in my files, maybe on my desktop, I've saved the, you know, the, the PDF. Um, but how do I know what the latest, you know, most authoritative guidance is? Where would I go for that? That's sort of first part of the question. And the second part of the question is, as an organization, what system do you put in place so that there's rules around who can approve, you know, version six and who signs off on it? Where do you file it? How do you, how does everybody know that that's been approved by the right level of manager? And, that's, and then that replaces the old guidance. And then that makes sure that everybody, when they're accessing that document, is getting version six and not using version five. So how do you maintain that whole version control on compliance documentation? Is there some good software for that or some system for routing approvals, getting them approved, storing the latest version? Well, one of the easiest implement there is going to be SharePoint because you have the op the ability to put workflows in into it. So, and and that's that's widely available. It does uh, a lot of exactly what you say is that the in setting up a program like this, you want to make sure that there's a central repository. Uh, a part of the training is to let's not use that PDF that's on your desktop. Let's always go on and make sure we check the central repository for the latest update of the information in the metadata of that you're going to you, you need to have the information about what do, what document supersedes what other document and again what changes have been made so you will have a change manager or a group of change managers that need to make approvals and edits to things um, and then they will uh, then update the final you know uh, outward facing version of it on wherever the, the repository is and then um, we'll ship out notices to, to people that things have changed. Another unique approach that has been used that can be taken is maybe a little bit dated right now, but take like sort of a wiki approach. And that's worked out very well for companies that have very active intranets. And what the wiki approach allows you to do, one of the benefits of having it is that as things are changing, you can actually sort of see where information has been redlined at. You can see where information has been put in or pinned it. And it can actually have notes there about when these things actually are effective and when they've gone into effect and what's been the changes to the previous process. Um, that's going to be a matter of how people access information and learn the best in particular organization. So that's always a learning experience. But essentially, you're always going to want to have a central repository for where things are, and you, you're going to definitely have to have custodians for the final version of the documentation. Um, the biggest thing is to limit those uh, data copies coming out there. And what we try to do there is make it, put it in a place where those documents are widely accessible, very widely accessible. You should be able to just, you know, type into your internet policies and procedures and find that very quickly and easily and also encourage people to make sure that there are, there are frequent updates. Um, if, as far as information about it, the best awareness that we can do there is if you have a, a newsletter, if you have anything that people get on a regular basis or the first page of the internet, if you start with the discipline of always making those announcements, people get accustomed to checking to see if there's something that's changed. Even if the announcements on a regular basis are things that processes policies that don't apply to them it still gives them that that um visibility that things are in flux and can be in flux i should take the latest and greatest version and that's what i should always use and also your management and your uh your your down the line management needs to enforce that as well okay great let's talk a little bit now about your practice so one of the things that's a been a really a theme of this podcast is is you know, the encouragement to really niche down and focus on a, um, you know, a narrow set of problems that you solve and a defined set of clients to serve. Um, some people are, you know, start out as real generalists, which, you know, gives them a greater surface area for project opportunities, but it's a little bit more shallow as well. And, um, there, you know, some people are a little bit concerned about getting too niche. Uh, I'd love to hear about how you came to focus on cybersecurity for utilities, which, you know, I mean, 
some people might say, wow, that sounds kind of narrow, but I imagine actually is a, is a quite a big, big ocean for you to work in. How did you get to that current focus? And maybe tell us a little bit about the type of work you do. Sure. Um, I came to that focus um, because of credibility, and I'm, I'm going to come back to that. So what I do is cybersecurity for utilities, as, as you said. And so that's a very specific niche. Uh, electric power utilities have a specific set of federal regulations brought down by the government regulatory agency over them, um, NERC that they have to follow. And this uh, includes everything from asset management, vulnerability assessments, and even supply chain and physical security around where um, IT assets are stored. I worked in the energy industry uh, since graduating college. So I just have a huge background in it. And I'm actually a third generation um, energy utility industry employee. I actually have a sister that works in a nuclear power, a brother that works in hydro. My father was an electrician. My grandfather was an electrician. So um, this was something that was um, dinner talk for us and tabletop. Um, I always, you know, knew a lot about this industry and and had a, had a deep knowledge in it. So it, when it came time to look at, you know, what was a practice that I could serve? And so we talk about that balance between niche and, and generalist. To me, the credibility of being able to be a person that has not only dealt with, let's say, the technology or technology in general, but it also actually understands this particular business and how this particular business operates, what their um, what their concerns are, uh, how a business makes money has been a very important thing. It adds so much credibility. It puts the clients more at ease and it ultimately results in a better product in, in a sense like this. What I always say about it, whether it's a bakery or a utility or a nuclear plant or a refinery, whatever sort of business that is, as consultants, if, if even if you're going to consult them on the technology and even if a lot of that technology is the same, there's going to be differences in how they use it and there's going to be differences in how they focus on it, what pieces of functionality they use, and also the alignment. And this is this is something that I think sometimes we miss when we're too general, is different industries are gonna have different alignments along their dependence on uh, technology, their dependence on risk management, their dependence on, on, on finance, based on the characteristics of that particular commodity or, or end product that they're making. Can you give us, some sense of the kind of IT of a utility. I it certainly occasionally hear it referenced in the news that there's concerns about that, that you know terrorists could hack the utility system and shut down the network. Um, and I, I think I've heard in the past that you know utilities have this kind of massive, network of their own maybe it's like almost separate from the internet like they're basically a private you know networks that they have to sense all of the different um you know uh generation and transmission and local distribution system could you just give us a little bit of an overview of the kind of it system that a utility has to manage sure um the best way to explain that is probably to start with explaining a little bit about how electricity works in North America. It's an interconnected grid. And we've heard of the power grid. And that power grid connects every utility to every other utility from, from California to Maine. And it's interconnected that way so that it can compensate for irregularities in power supply or you know adverse conditions or anything like that. So it can be able to route power from one side of the country or one place to another. That uh, it helps us keep the, the electric grid as a whole reliable. Uh, uh, us here in the United States, we're very accustomed to turning on a light switch and the lights coming on. We're not accustomed to having you know unreliable power, not knowing if um, our devices are going to work that day or not, um, not having you know widespread rolling blackouts or, or widespread interruptions. So there's an interconnection between all of these power plants, substations, transmission lines and transformers. The IT network that includes the systems that run and manage 
those power plants that move them up and down to produce more or less power when and where the demand is needed run parallel to that network. It is not a separate system per se, because you know someone in the industry is going to listen to this and, and um, you know take a point of order that it is not a separate system than the internet, but it does run separately encrypted and it does connect all of these power plants in um, you know through an information tunnel that is not the standard information tunnel that all of our other traffic's going on even though it's hopping on and off of those different systems it works essentially like you said i just had to clarify that it's not a separate internet but it's a separate piece of the internet that these things are are controlling each other on inside internally to a to a um, utility it works the same way as well utilities have their business networks and that's where you have accounting accounts payable and your your company intranet and a lot of those other things your normal business networks that every company is going to have and then they would have their power supply network or their SCADA network and it's supervisor control and data acquisition those that's the network that actually uh controls information about the power plants about moving a plant up or moving a plant down and that's the area of the grid that people are most concerned about being vulnerable for a lot of interesting reasons Tell us a little bit about some of those concerns about some of the the things that people are you know concerned that a, a bad actor might might be able to do uh, if they were able to access those systems. Well, one of the things that you'd be able to do is that you'd be able to deprive electricity for large areas of the country and major and major metropolitan areas. Uh, that would lead to you know huge economic impact as well as societal impact. Uh, one of the things we use for reference is the uh, blackout that was in um, the northeastern United States in the early 2000s um, that affected New York City. And um, there were billions of dollars worth of food spoilage. Uh, there was lots of things that we took for granted at that time where because uh, all electricity was down, hospitals couldn't admit people, pharmacies couldn't prescribe medicines, um, you had people out of work, you had if, you know, the ability to get people information was um, uh, was damaged because obviously we're not getting television broadcasts, that sort of thing. So that's the, the worst scenario. Um, the worst scenario is that we deprive people. Um, and as I said, I just thought and an even worse scenario is that if the plants could be compromised and we have a mix of generation across the country, we have nuclear uh, we have some renewable generation. We also have a uh, coal and natural gas generation. Um, if those plants could be compromised in a way that would cause them to misoperate, you could not only just take power down and be the inconvenience of not having access to power in an area, you could also cause an, an environmental um, situation. You could cause something to you know catch fire something that could actually cause uh, more long-term damage and also in, endanger loss, uh, in, in, you know, endanger life to, to people. So there's, there's a huge, you know, thing where we sort of take that, that for granted, that industry kind of works because we just magically pay our power bill and we just magically know that, um, you know, everything that we plug up in our house comes, comes on. Um, someone being able to access the systems that run it uh, causes a huge concern. And then the concern there is that, well, the power grid itself is uh, decades old. Uh, a lot of the equipment is decades old. A lot of the equipment is not as modern um, because of the huge sunk cost and investment in the equipment because of the way these things have been running and also because of the problems with taking sections of the grid down for repairs. It's very tough to um, holistically upgrade a lot of these systems and again when you're talking about even computer systems and software that's even just a decade or, or or too old it's going to have inherent vulnerabilities in it it's going to have you know things uh you know it wasn't built for the the modern day obviously correct um the challenge that that faces is how do then we protect sort of an outmoded system but one that we can't just uh, wholesale update or wholesale update them across the grid. The other issue here is that there's a ubiquity in some of the systems that are used to actually run 
actual power plants on the grid. And this is different than the office and corporate systems we have. You know, if you go to a utility office, it's just like everywhere else where, you know, people are going to have laptops and computers and monitors and they're going to have Outlook and Word and Excel and, and using those. The systems that actually run the power plants are more highly niche, very specialized equipment that specifically is used to regulate a substation or to regulate a power plant. There's a handful of companies that build the systems for it, and they sell those systems all across the world. So the other thing is, is that you have people in other parts of the world that have access and have an unlimited time and test bed to the same computer systems that haven't been updated here that are running our power plants. And so there's a huge chance of reverse engineering if you don't do something to prevent their access to the system, since you can't harden or update the system itself as readily. So what what's an example of a type of, um, you know, acts of a way that someone might be able to gain access to the system. Maybe, you know, maybe sort of a gap that existed four or five years ago that now most utilities have plugged. Uh, you know, is it, um, is, you, you sort of hear so m many, you know, com companies getting compromised on the more business side, you know, Target, Data Breach, Marriott, you know, the, even like the White House Office of Personnel, I think it was. Um, and t Twitter, you know, people breaking into that and doing the social engineering. So what are some ways that a bad actor might be able to access, you know, these utility power systems and, and what's being done to prevent that? It's, it's done in a very similar way, Will, where the way these systems talk to the outside world is through the internet, through an outside connection. Um, because these systems are a little bit older and maybe their code is a little bit older, that they were set to access on very specific ports or very very specific uh, addresses and locations that they talk to the internet on and they're not able to talk to the internet through any other way so um a bad actor would know that this if i can gain access to that data stream because i know exactly where it's coming from then i can then send information back to that system and something very simple whereas if we're trying to let's say regulate the output of a power plant if i change all of the threes to fives then you would you know it, it would call it would cause issues so basically just hijacking the information feed from the outside a lot of times by coming through the actual corporate network of the system what we're doing what we have to do to sort of fix that is we have to be a lot more creative in the ways that these systems access the outside world and we have to put uh, more barriers between them so we'll just think about just firewalls and other network devices that interrogate traffic that do things that make sure that it's coming from a valid source or making sure that it's not getting corrupt information but it also has to do that in a timely enough fashion not to interrupt the real-time nature which is another aspect of the energy industry that's very unique is that it runs in real time um you don't you know because the the supply of electricity to the country is 24 7 365. so what we do is we we um we just put more barriers it's a defense in depth and we do more to scrub and look at data try to look at data signatures and re reject information that does not seem like it's coming from the source that it should come from, or seems like it, it contains erroneous data. It's just having having a, a less trust barrier. Also, we separate uh, where we can through um, using DMZs, also sometimes using air gapping where you can to minimize the number of inputs and, uh, of ways into that system as much as possible. And we want to divorce it from the corporate network as, as, as much as possible. So you sort of look at it like, you know, if you if you have a if you have a house and you have you know a front door, a back door, a side door, and you know you, and you need a way to get in the house, but you don't need all three doors. It's like, well, let's just board up a couple of these doors, and let's just concentrate on looking at everything through the front door, so that we know something's not coming through the side door when we're not when we're not looking at it. 
Um, so conversely, that, that's what we're doing. Then we put a lot of locks and chains and deadbolts on the one door that we're keeping open. Um, to make a poor analogy, that's sort of what we're doing in the industry. And the since the architecture varies from place to place, um, it's always a, a new challenge to do this. Um, it's not a one size fits all because our the way our electricity grid works is that it's a it's an interconnection between a lot of different private utilities that may use slightly different technologies and use slightly different architectures and also have you know different budgets and um and and different um levels of uh, of talent that put the architecture together so it's 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 a constant problem and then at the same time while we're retrofitting we're also becoming aware of new, of, more, of newer threats and newer ways that people are get are getting in. So we're really sort of working into both ends. I, I call it the kind of trying to drive a car and pave the road at the same time. Sometimes. How do you kind of stay top of mind with you, the buyers of cybersecurity services at utilities around the country? Do you uh, attend conferences? Do you, um, you know, publish? You know, you've got the book, of course. Um, do you publish much? Do you just do a lot of re reaching out to people that you know? How how do you do that client development side? So one good thing about being in a niche like this is you you've you've worked. It's a, it's a small world. You've worked with a lot of people. You've worked with some with some of the best minds, and because it's cybersecurity, because it's a system where we're all trying to use the latest and greatest techniques to you know, stop the worst from happening, and we're all working with some of the same architectures and infrastructures. My community is very apt to share. So what we do, what we do, yes, I you know, attend conferences, but I have a lot of talk with my industry colleagues, both at, at client sites, both other cons and, and other consultants as well. And we like to just football. We make it, we make it a point that we um, talk with each other, that we, we come up with scenarios and cases that we say, how, how are you going to fix that? Um, because it's so small, it's great to touch people and people don't mind sharing and keeping top of mind with it. Um, also, what we do is we all will generally subscribe to the seminars that the government puts out. So what, what happens is when a threat becomes, you know, fairly um, prol prolific in the industry, the guidance from the federal government will um, rise to, to sort of meet that need. They'll put down new floors. And when they... Uh, update their regulations that starts a whole chain of us talking there's lots of bloggers out there there's lots of uh, consultants like myself and as well as my my clients and my colleagues that have just regular conversations um and that's really because no one else really wants to talk about this with us so uh, we have to talk about each other talk about it with each other that's kind of kind of what we say up today um obviously because i'm a cyber security any articles in the news, anything that comes across, you know, any sort of media regarding it is something that's going to get a lot of attention from me. And to the extent that I can see this is something applicable, the first thing I'm going to do is that I'm going to send it out to our colleagues. So in the cybersecurity for utilities niche, we have a great community. And that's one of the ways that we stay on top of things. And where do those conversations take place? Is that is there like a private forum somewhere? Is it just in person, one on one, like phone calls, or is it a conversations on Twitter? Like, wh wh where are these conversations taking place? A lot of the conversations uh, take place peer to peer. So you know, we we will get up and give each other a call and and talk. There there are some excellent blocks out there for the industry. Um, there's one that I like, it's Tom Aldrich's blog. He pretty much becomes the compendium for all things, um, energy, utility, cybersecurity. Uh, that's a big go-to, and he's also just a friend to all of us consultants and a friend to the, to the industry in terms of being accessible. Um, in terms of other social media, really not a lot out there. It's pretty niche. There are some groups on LinkedIn that um, you know disseminate information and do things. But really, when you're immersed in this and you're doing it, when you're engaged with clients and utilities that are dealing with this um, as, a, as a constant threat, there's no shortage of conversations that you're going to have 
with uh, other colleagues, other consultants, and other practitioners just in your day-to-day -day consulting life. So that is still kind of our main source of information. But if someone's interested about it, um, I would I would first off point them to, uh, to Tom's log and um, look that up and look up NERC SIP, and that's uh, that stands for Critical Infrastructure Protection. If you were to just Google like a NERC, NERC CIP log, you'll come up with several things that kind of show you where we're at in our thinking. And again, like I said, it's a lot of the thinking, a lot of the ways that we're looking to um, deal with these threats. It, the information is very much out there because unlike a lot of other things is that there's not really as much of a competitive advantage of hoarding information about how to keep the entire grid safe. So there's a little, there's less proprietary, more things that, that we like to share. So I think that there's a wealth of information out there for anyone who's interested enough to look. And probably anyone that works in this field will be happy to, to talk to you a lot about it because um, we, you know, uh, have a lot to say and, and we're immersed in it. Yeah. What about your book on, um, on compliance? Like what have you done to sort of spread the word on that? Have you held, um, kind of webinars or virtu other virtual events or, you know, just emailed it out to people that, you know, how have you used that to, to raise your, your visibility? Um, well, I put this together just a few months ago when I had a, a little bit of a downtime between engagements. And uh, so far, I've just spread it among my friends. I've put it on uh, social media uh, that's, you know, targeted at people in my industry and, and my friend group and sort of and, and advertised it there. Nothing larger than that. Nothing like having a having a webinar or or promoting it larger than that this is really my first time talking about it i sort of plan to uh do more in that realm i did provide some copies for some former colleagues of mine um to you know to stay updated with and i look forward to kind of you know talking with them about it again i just like to use it as a primer i i think it's something i'm going to use on engagements it's something i'm going to recommend to to people to just kind of take walk through the steps because this is really a first step with with a lot of people and so it was just sort of let's just document this once and for all so that we can all get on sort of a, a common um footing into how we organize a program that's going to keep people safe so I, I really like having it it's just going to be um a companion that i'm going to take with me um with uh future clients yeah sounds like a great tool lemon where can people find you online? I can be found um, at ionadogroup.com. That's I-O-N-A-D-O. -O. That's the name of my consulting firm. Uh, from there, you can um, find contact information about me and uh, service lines and what we do. And you'll be able to also find me, Lemon Williams, uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, I... And with the I and group, and we are based out of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, the book itself uh, is available on Amazon, and it's also searchable under my name, Lemon Williams. Or if anyone just has the insane urge to put in how to write quality compliance documentation, they can also find it there. Um, those are the kind of the best places to reach me and the best ways to reach me. Um, I try to be as accessible as possible because uh, obviously in consulting that's going to be the name of the game fantastic lemon thank you so much for being on the show uh this is great we'll include those links in the show notes and for new listeners to the show um if you like the show and you want to give it a you know five star review on itunes that would be really appreciated it does help uh people find the show uh, and if you were going to give it something less than five stars, just, you know, really don't bother. Um, Lemon, again, thanks for coming. It was really great speaking with you. Well, thank you so much for the time. I really enjoyed it.